We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we've got a very short time. I see almost nobody um, in the room um, in Katowice, but we do have um, Nashilonga from, from Ria there. Um, and Nashilonga, hopefully you're able to um, communicate with us and um, just take any questions that they may be, uh, or help us take the questions from the floor um, as we um, go along. We have um, a very exciting panel for us today on our panel on, on data justice, what is to be done, a very big question to address in a very short period of time. Um, my name is Alison Gilwald. I'm the Executive Director of Research ICT Africa. I run a doctoral program at the University of Cape Town's Nelson Mandela School on Public Governance um, on, on uh, Digital Economy and Society. Um, very, very pleased to have with us today a number of um, partners uh, also working on the, on the subject of data justice, um, some practitioners, um, representatives of civil society, advocates um, for data justice. Um, I think at the moment we have um, uh, Lynette Taylor, who's Professor of International Data at Tilburg University. And um, we've, and uh, sorry, the, uh, the Institute for Law, Technology and Society. And we have um, uh, Parminder Singh, um, from IT for Change, and um, we've got uh, Jamila. Uh, so, so we don't have Alexandria Walden. Um, Kito, can you just see if she's um, joining us online and if we should wait for her? But I don't think we'll have to give her much time. We have Jamila Venturini, um, who's joining us from Directus Digitalis, um, and you can probably do a nice proper Spanish pronunciation of that when you introduce yourself, um, Jamila. And then we very kindly um, have had uh, Siswe Snail, also from the South African um, Information Regulator, um, step in for us. Um, and um, I think if we don't have um, Alexandria um, Walden from, from Google in, we will just have to um, uh, hope that she joins us and, and, and start. Um, so this um, panel really um, arises out of a um, project that we have been developing um, within Research ICT Africa with a, um, a, a grant from the International Development Research Center that's really supported our work and supported the work of a number of people um, collaborating with us in this area and really um, has um, built on and drawn on the work of um, Lynette Taylor um, who has been pioneering work in this in this area and developing it, and and supporting us in thinking about these issues, particularly from a from a global path, um, south perspective, and the challenges of of, of implementing them, um, uh, and also the uh, work of um, Parminder Singh and Anita Gurmursi from IT for Change who've provided a, a very interesting aspect to this work um, around actually realizing data justice um, beyond the you know, human rights um, framing of it that um, has really distinguished it from some of the other just kind of data protection, um, quite sort of technical work that, is, um, that, that has been done um, uh, around the world, but um, often um, sort of exemplified in the, in, the, in the GDPR, which of course does have a, a rights framework as well, but how that applies to the, to, to the global South. Um, so, um, you know, we, the, the, the part about our work is that like many of the people on, the, in the, on this panel, we are concerned with taking this research to, to, to policy influence, to ensuring um, uh, just outcomes, social uh, social justice, um, and and digital inequality, quality more broadly. So um, we've been, you know, we do quite a lot of technical assistance, and we've recently been um, involved with the um, 
commissioning of the uh, African Union data policy framework, which we were, uh, supported them on developing. It's actually just been navigated through the various um, validation processes and with member states. Um, and try to see how practically one could bring some of these um, concepts, you know, uh, concepts of, of, of justice into creating enabling frameworks practically um, on the ground and moving them from, you know, quite normative um, or theoretical um, and principled arguments, but actually taking them through to these very high level principle frameworks that are being developed. So the, the, the data policy, um, the Africa data policy framework really goes way beyond data protection. Um, and I think in this way, we were able also to move from, you know, the um, quite negative regulation components or the kind of regulatory compliance um, dimensions of, of data protection, you know, preventions, penalties, that kind of thing for, for, for breaches, um, mainly around privacy and very individual, individualized notions of privacy to um, broader um, um, conceptions of, of data policy and what is required ensure, in, in order to ensure that it um, is, is more just, is able to redress some of the uneven distribution of opportunities and harms that we uh, see under the current um, sort of data um, default frameworks, um, primarily at the moment um, in the broader data sense, not only in just the data protection sense, which is obviously quite regulated, but in the broader sense, um, data um, processing management um, treatment, especially for artificial intelligence increasingly, kind of largely self-regulated, although I've been on various panels this morning, including a parliamentary panel um, on the parliamentary track, which is looking at, at, at AI um, 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 regulation. Um, so I think that it, you know, that something is arising there, but basically in terms of where we've got to up to here, um, you know, the, uh, social networks, uh, use of artificial intelligence, although there's been some discussion around um, focusing on algorithmic regulation, the basic framework at the moment is largely a, you know, it's, it's a self-regulatory one. Um, we've got a number of standards, um, we've got a number of uh, ethics by design frameworks that have emerged. Um, which um, have been, I mean, more kind of more ethics by design frameworks now than um, some of the sort of really hardcore standards. Um, but very often those are used as substitutes for both um, rights regulation. Um, so, you know, it's kind of equated once you've dealt with um, ethics by design, you've got your rights issues sorted out, which I think um, Jamila and several others will speak to the problems with that. Um, but also that it deals with some of the, um, you know, and what it really doesn't deal with is some of the issues of um, economic and social redress. So really looking beyond just first generation rights on, on privacy um, and looking at second and third generation, you know, social and economic rights and how we realize those as well, um, which current data policy, you know, data protection frameworks that in Africa, by and large, we've just adopted from elsewhere, really, um, you know, don't, don't address those issues. So lots and lots for us to discuss. I'm greatly looking forward to it. Let me not take up any more of, of the time that um, our panelists can, can, can give us. Um, Lynette, can I ask you to, to start, perhaps if you just want to start with a brief um, introduction of, of, of yourself, your um, your, your Tilburg School and um, also your the, the current kind of work you're working on, but just briefly because we've only got a few minutes in the first round, so to get to the topic. Thanks so much. Of course, can I ask Alison, do you want me just to introduce myself or also to 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 make a provocation and, and give a little content? So, so Lynette, just because um, we actually do have put your short bios in the chat, just yeah. anything that you need as a prelude to making your provocation. Okay, Thank you. sure. Um, the only prelude is that that I, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here, and that in 2017 I brought together in a paper the point of view of a bunch of people who think about how data affects civil society around the world. Um, and I brought it together because I thought that we needed to bring together issues of surveillance and rights in relation to surveillance with issues of development and people's collective right to development. And trying to balance those two things out seemed a problem that the word ju data justice was very well, um, well formed to describe. 
And so I've been working since 2017 on that problem of how you bring together people's right to be seen and represented with their right to be left alone when they choose to be and how their subjective needs can be brought into the picture when we think about the data economy. So that's, that's my intro. Sorry, just trying to deal with the noise at the background. Um, Paminda, perhaps you could just give us uh, uh, your first intervention, your provocation. Thank you. Well, if you go, uh, so my introduction, uh, I wouldn't go into it. I work for IT for Change. And if you call it a provocation, the provocation here is that data protection and GDPR may relatively be non-political in that sense that there is large consensus. And I know the relationship between individual and state or individual and corporations is not non-political. But what is really political in the Southern sense is the economic rights. And you wouldn't simply get, uh, you know, Northern uh, expertise and academic uh, thing uh, to do it for you. Though I completely understand that in intellectual property uh, and trade justice, there are huge amount of Western intellectual uh, contributions and original framings. And I'm not saying it won't happen, but South has to get up and do it. And what I want to introduce here and talk later is that Indian government, and I'm part of that committee, has a committee report one year earlier which actually lays out completely the conceptual framework of uh, community rights on data. It actually analyzes community ownership of resources in many fields, including convention on biodiversity. It goes to water resources and collective rights, and then uh, extracts five principles. I'm going to cut paste those five principles and it applies those five principles to uh, data uh, rights. <laughs> so it does the conceptual work and on the other side, it goes right up to what does it mean? Uh, what does community rights on data means? How can a community enforce sharing of data? What kind of data can be enforced? What cannot be enforced? What are the intellectual properties? So it does a systematic uh, analysis of it. And my provocation is that nobody even looks at that report. It's one year old, uh, second draft. And that is uh, the capture of uh, discursive uh, spaces. Uh, which South needs to fight against. You asked me for a provocation, and this is mine, thanks. Thanks very much, um, Paminda. Um, um, I'm just, Keto, we don't have Alexandria on board, do we yet? Because I think that would be a nice uh, response. We're unable to get hold of um, Alexandria. Okay. So, Paminda, I was going to suggest that Google's representative might be a, a, a good response to that, that idea of capture, but I'm sure Jamila can um respond to that equally thank you jamila thanks alison actually yes i'd like to share some thoughts based on research we have done here in latin america and i think dialogue a bit with what perminder was sharing about um the the provocation he did from the indian context and the document that he was mentioning i guess one thing we have been uh, seeing is that there is this digital agenda being pushed in different contexts without any further considerations on legality, necessity, proportionality in the deployment of specific technology and in the complete absence of transparency and participation mechanisms. Um, I can mention some examples uh, while we develop the conversation, but um, what we see is that there is a blind trust in technology and there, there is a complete disregard to evidence-based policy and plan um, that in a human rights language, again, could be translated into these principles of necessity and proportionality. And it seems that there is a contradiction behind that because state at the same time is eager to collect data, but does not rely, rely on data for their own actions, for instance, no? Um, maybe I can bring a quick example to give more materiality to what I'm trying to say. Um, in the research we did around the use of uh, technology during the pandemic, what we saw was that in some countries they tried to implement such technology that were considered effective in other countries while there was no underlying infrastructure that would facilitate the same implementation of technology so the state was basically um, um, transferring to citizens the responsibility to produce data that produce data that they were not able to produce themselves and i get that, i guess that reflects um a bit of uh, the moment we are in terms of um, the development of such digital agenda that is naturalizing the the use of technology as something that by itself will solve several 
social and economic problems. And the final point to, to let uh, another provocation is that most of the discourse behind um, the promotion of such a digital agenda that is arriving in Latin America has to do with development, inclusion, and innovation. And I guess there is no room for experimentation when it comes to exploring people's data, particularly in our countries. So we cannot afford such irresponsible type of techno solutionism anymore. We are still to see the types of consequences that the, the idea of um, predictive systems in, in, uh, in um, um, in, in sectors like health, education, social welfare, et cetera, we will have in our societies. So I guess this is a, a, a point we can start uh, this conversation and I would love to share more examples as we continue. Sure, thank you so much, Jamila. Um, Siswe, I think um, I'm gonna ask you just for a, a sort of higher level um, response first. I know I did ask you to, to, to talk about how this can practically be applied, but I think we, we, we're still dealing with some of the, the um, broader conceptual issues. So I just wondered if you could provide us with an African perspective on some of the issues that have been raised around, um, you know, different notions of, of, of um, privacy of data, of collective data, of not necessarily only individualized data, uh, individualized privacy and these kinds of uh, legal concepts which you're working with on a daily basis. Yes, thank you very much. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting from, from an African perspective uh, to see, you know, the uptake of data protection legislation, cybersecurity legislation, legislation relating to, to critical infrastructure, and you know it's 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 quite refreshing to see that there, there is no development between you know stifling um, I'm saying not stifling innovation and allowing new technologies as AI to 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 be there. But on the other hand, looking at the human rights effects of these human rights um, issues that AI brings. For instance, you know, the automatic decision-making that may result of a, you know, from an AI process, things like um, being exposed to, to data breaches, these are new concepts to Africans, you know? And it's, it's however very refreshing to notice that the former dark African continent now is very open to, to privacy and cybersecurity issues, as well as the human rights matters that go with that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very refreshing to be here and to give you that perspective. Um, and, and just a, a, a just finished my term um, seven days ago. But nevertheless, thank you for, for having me. Thank you, Siswe. And actually, we can come back to that because you've been there from the inception of the information regulator, and it's faced all sorts of um, legislative and institutional challenges in, in becoming operational. So although it was, you know, um, really uh, a leading in terms of, you know, the, the, the time that Popier was introduced, the um, Protection of Private Information Act was introduced, but it took a long time to operationalize and get into force and be resourced, etc. So some of the challenges of, you know, we, we can get all the all the concepts right, and we, or maybe we can't, we can't, but um, actually getting these implemented, getting these realized on the ground is what I really want to come to in the next round. But um, Linus, before we do that, um, I, I you know, um, I just want to return to, I mean, you've, you've spoken very strongly about data justice, you know, being this complement to our, you know, other legal um, human rights um, frameworks, etc. Um, and, and the importance of um, it, be, you know, establishing the concept of data justice as a, a kind of, um, you know, a hard stop on some of these things that, you know, comes into force as a default that you know, make sure that communities' um, data is, you know, um, treated uh, justly throughout the entire process and these kinds of things. Um, I think COVID and the, you know, the, the pandemic has really highlighted also we, the, the, the public value that there may be in, you know, collecting data and using data in an informed and, and fair way, obviously, and, you know, anonymized data and that sort of thing. But it's really highlighted some of the 
the um, collective, the public interest components of, of surveillance, um, of, of mass surveillance, that I think is interestingly, you know, quite common in um, medical research. So, you know, the surveillance of people's condition is treated as quite a positive thing. And I think you know, coming together, the epidemiology kind of approach to it, of, you know, needing this information in order to, to protect and, you know, prevent harm and risk, um, and a, you know, the, the, the data kind of framework that's in the first instance resistance to, to the surveillance and how we you know reconcile that um, as we you know deal with a probably you know semi-pandemic pandemic semi pandemic, pandem uh, semi -a -pandemic future yeah so this is a great point you make Alison I think that it's important to note that epidemiology that has gone on is similar to the epidemiology that would have gone on a hundred years ago it's just digitized and that gives it scope it gives it power and what we see is that that power has been fed back to the public around the world in very unequal and uneven ways. And that although we have a good medical data infrastructure that's come out of the pandemic, and I think there's general recognition that this is really important and that we need the science. There are also issues where communities have had uneven access to that information for reasons of infrastructure, for reasons of data literacy and education. And just because some have not been included in decision making about what should happen as a result of the data. So we still see these data sources and these data collection practices kind of reflecting and refracting the problems that we have with data already and the inequalities that data can amplify. And, and I wanted to add something to my earlier provocation, if that's okay, that, that we're, we're using our work to move towards the idea of a normative commitment that comes above law with the idea that as we move further towards rule of law with regard to the digital, we need good law. Otherwise, we, we just get coercion and enforcement. Um, and that in order to do that, we can't just seek that in our existing data protection acts, our AI acts, these things. We need an overall normative framing of the kind that Baminda is talking about, I think. Um, and that that normative framing needs to be that data should follow the interests of the people it represents throughout its life cycle, which is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do because our practices mean that data gets aggregated and de-identified and then passes out of any kind of control and just becomes a commodity that can be traded openly on the market. And I think we need to think about the implications of that and when that is not appropriate, we need to think about a kind of golden rule for data where it follows the interest, where it remains true to the interests of the communities that generate it, regardless of what happens to it, which requires a bunch of new infrastructures, a bunch of new modes of governance, and which actually breaks large chunks of our international data market as it currently is. You can't monetize data in the same way. You have to have ways of transmitting the needs and wishes of communities throughout the international system, which don't currently exist. So I, I think I'm going along the same lines as, as Praminda and Yamila here in saying that connecting knowledge of uses and harms to the international governance structure is lagging way behind our ability to channel and use data. Absolutely. Jamila, your um, earlier provocation sort of tied very strongly into that and you gave examples of the work that you've done um, uh, under, during COVID. Um, would you just like to, to build on those a bit more? You said you'd like to, to provide some examples of um, uh, kind of what's gone wrong and possibly um, also tell us how, you know, we might, how this might be corrected. So um, uh, Lynn has spoken, you know, very much about, um, you know, some, a, a, a complementary um, normative fray, a normative basis to the very strong legal basis that's required. Um, but you know, practically, how does how does that happen? How do you know? Is it through advocacy? How does that actually um, um, allow us to realize data justice? Thanks, Alison. Yes, I'd like to react a bit to what uh, Lynette was saying because I I think that that is very concrete in our context in Latin America. We basically saw very precarious tech infrastructure implemented in the public sector that were not able to uh, provide um, relevant information for society when it was needed around the advance of the, the cases, for instance, right? So the, the, the answer that they try to give 
coming from this logic of uh, innovation and tech deployment and, and, and uh, uh, individual use or individual collection of data was to develop apps and they explicitly saying that said that through self-diagnosis apps they would be able to obtain information on how the pandemic have advanced considering that in some countries they didn't have the digital infrastructure to share um, uh, um, results from diagnosis in real time to the uh, competent authority. And I guess that's very serious. And that brings us to this discussion on how do we develop uh, this digital agenda grounded in what is a public interest and not in a logic of uh, uh, a corporate logic that is based on data exploitation, on individual application and et cetera. And how do you uh, embed um, justice also from the tech design? What we saw interesting examples on this type of uh, COVID apps, they included different functionalities, but you could see that in some countries, they were completely individualized. One person could only use one application in one specific device. And that's completely um, away from our reality in terms of connectivity. Other countries consider the need to allow more than one people to use the same application. And that could be an application for self-diagnosis, that could be an application that would give um, people the right to circulate during the quarantines that were implemented, that could be an application that would allow access to emergency cash transfer during the pandemic. So we're talking about very basic social and economic rights that were involved in the use of such apps that proved uh, somehow uh, necessary in this case. We could think of, uh, of that, but there is a lot that we have to continue to build on that. So I would say that to your final question on how um, we could move forward, I guess the, a, a serious digital agenda uh, for the global south at least need to begin by creating these data governance structures that allows the flow of public interest information among institutions and that have the, the safeguards that includes assuring right to access to information as a basic pillar that is not present in, in several of the countries and several of the cases that we, we saw and also the protection of, of price, privacy in a balanced way. Of course, we still have a lot of challenge to come in that sense in Latin America. America. We have a lack of norm proper normative frameworks, even for data protection, lack of uh, institutions that are capable of uh, supervising that. But I guess we have to shift the idea of the digital agenda to build this basic underlying uh, um, governance standards from which we can continue to, to develop uh, um, other, other initiatives. And I would, just to finalize, I, I would say that that cannot be disconnected from investments on basic connectivity infrastructures. And I, I imagine you, Alison, would have a lot to comment on that. And also policies that foster some type of local technological development and data sovereignty, because uh, uh, otherwise we continue to be dependent on the types of narratives and the types of logics that are embedded on uh, foreign uh, technology that's being pushed to our countries. Thanks, Jamila. Um, I'm sure Paminda wants to come on in on your last point, but before he does, I just wanted to go to Siswe. Um, and Siswe, just you know, building on, on, on the points that both um, Jamila and Linet have made, but particularly this last point by um, uh, Jamila. So, you know, I think across many parts of the global south, but certainly across Africa and even in South Africa, which has probably the highest internet penetration rates in sub-Saharan Africa anyway, um, you know, basically all this technological hype of what, you know, this could do um, to, to assist us gather the information and, you know, protect us from the disease um, was moot because in fact, we just don't have, you know, enough smart devices to be able to use them for contact tracing. We weren't even able to um, mobilize the um, um, mobile operators data, you know, which we have very sophisticated um, mobile operators and data um, to kind of create the data analytics and dashboards that we needed. So, I, you know, the thing with information regulators as they're um, burgeoning on the continent, and it's very exciting to see, is that they are um, preoccupied primarily with these quite conventional notions of data protection um, and, and privacy um, in dealing with harms, but not really the you know, very fundamental harm in the global south of exclusion, 
of you know the invisibility of people from these data sets um, and you know at best under representation of them um, in the data sets and the kind of implications for this when we start seeing these you know, being made being used for um, decision making um, so I just wondered if you know in your especially as the outgoing now but having you know served a, a period of time in a, in a new in a startup regulator um, you know how, how do we um, link to those social and economic points that Parminda was making when he in his first provocation. I, I, I like the um, context in which you, you're asking me that question. I mean, I, I recently wrote a short piece on, on access to information and how the right to access to information is actually paramount in order for, for individuals to number one, access the internet itself. In other words, access to the internet has now metamorphosized the right to access to information as we would have in, in South Africa, which on the other hand, obviously is, is you know, one, one has to look at the, the data protection effects of that. And, and, you know, South Africa is a very weird uh, DPA because um, the DPA, doesn't only deal with data protection, but also with access to information. So I, I actually look forward to seeing the integration of access to information and data protection. For, for the longest of time, you've correctly pointed out that regulators have spent, uh, you know, trying to get people to understand data protection, conventional data protection, and just getting people to understand that there are not data protection laws. But uh, I think it's, it's very nice to see that um, this data protection laws that we have, they don't just sit there in isolation. In other words, for, for you to have data protection laws, you need data subjects and data subjects need access to information and access to information, like I says, is a metamorphosized right of the legal right to access to information. So the, 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 the access to the internet, you know, the, the ability to communicate, that in itself is, is one thing that we need to look at when looking at the overall issues pertaining to data justice. So you, you are quite right, you know, I think the DPAs must now open their horizons um, when it looks at research issues, look at things pertaining to surveillance, look at things pertaining to competition law, for instance, how that intersects with data protection, um, look at cybersecurity and, and cyber criminality. I, I always say cybersecurity and cyber criminality and data protection all come from a common ancestor called vulnerability. You know? So, but, but like I said, from the African perspective, um, maybe one should now start looking at these areas, you know, these specific areas, such as artificial intelligence and, and the effects thereof, and, and whether people will be affected by decisions that are made as a result of data sets that are not complete due to the fact that the data subjects are not accessible to be on those data sets. I hope I've, I've, I haven't said too much. No, Sizwe, thanks very much. I mean, you 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 kind of remind us of those fundamental um, you know, rights. And I think what's what is interesting about the Papier Act is the two sides to it. Um, that is not evident in a lot of the other um, you know, uh, data protection or um uh, digital policy for the for the continent. So the Malabo Convention, for example, looks at cybersecurity and data protection, which has been a kind of more comfortable. Um, terrain for some of the governments or some of the member states of the African Union that don't have very strong um, you know, bills of rights or constitutional protections um, of rights. And so they've been able to kind of deal with, you know, harmonize cybersecurity and these kinds of things. In fact, very often they've embraced it because they've been used for, for public surveillance. Um, so, I mean, I think very interesting in the context of South Africa, where you've got the strong um, constitutional um, uh, framework and this um, um, <clears throat> protection of, 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 of citizens, but in fact, we still have half the population who's not enjoying the benefits of they, they don't actually enjoy what you've 
regarded, you know, it's described as a metamorphosis of the um, freedom of expression um, or the right to information, um, because not in not in the digitalized world that we're largely engaging in, which really takes us back to um, Parminda's point about, um, you know, firstly, the global south not, you know, not just being data subjects, we actually also want to be data producers and developers and, and sell our stuff and you know, contribute to the prosperity of our nations. Um, and essentially, the kind of frameworks that we have at the moment that are, um, at best, you know, um, human rights, first generation human rights based, um, really don't allow us to redress those structural constraints on, on our participation. Um, and that's really what the um, IT for Change work has been exploring, um, and quite a lot of resistance from this self-regulatory framework that we find ourselves in to the kind of um, economic regulation that you've been um, calling for, Parminda. So I'm wondering if you could um, tell us a bit more about that approach and why you feel that's necessary. Uh, thanks, Alison. I mean, data justice is a vast subject. We have already seen there's a data protection issue, there is fairness and justice of economic distribution issue, there are downstream issues, which Sosway was talking about, and Zamila also pointed, and there are up, upstream issues. So I'll use my two, three minutes to focus on one part where I think the whole story starts. Now, Lynette was right. She kept on saying about we being on the table, who decides what happens with the data and et cetera. And there seems to be this feeling that somehow data related norms and somebody said that norms are needed and uh, laws are needed and norms and laws are not being made, uh, uh, but actually they are being made. And civil society's responsibility is to uh, visibilize that. And we have been working before we started working on data thing, which I just told about in India, we are working for 15 years about global governance mechanisms. So the South has a seat. And I'll just give you an example about AI governance how it happens today. And I'll just relate the whole chain of events and exactly the same way data, go uh, data governance and data norms building has happened. In OECD, there is a body called Committee for Digital Economy Policy, which is at the center of much of this norms making. It is a method of working, which is multilateral along with stakeholder advisory bodies, which is good. Somehow everybody calls that system as a multi-stakeholder system. And I'll come to the system in UN, the same system becomes uh, somehow multilateral. Uh, now this system adopted, and I'm just taking a thin streak of AI governance. In 2018, they adopted AI norms, AI principles, and remember as a legal instrument, it was a legal instrument. It's on their legal instruments page. They adopted AI principles. They decided, they adopted. And how does it work then? Five months later, they go to G20 and tell them, adopt these. And G20, and I'm very happy that India is there and they did it, not only adopts them and they're not being subtle. Actually, OECD principles are adopted and they are mentioned in the annex. It's not that they just use the language. They just said they are in the annex and we adopt it. That's fine. They want to go beyond. They want to get all the countries. Then they float a partnership on AI which is called multi-stakeholder. Again, it's not multi-stakeholder. It is a central council, which is only governments. And now to make it multi-stakeholder and get all countries in, it is very clear there is a fact, fact question, frequently asked question. Why is this AI partnership, uh, the secretariat is in the OECD and they're completely non-subtle about it. It says it is in the OECD so that OECD can keep providing leadership in AI principle making. Once we accept these systems downstream, they will have the effect we are talking about. And this is how AI principles and norm making is made. And let me tell you the last thing. In 2011, India went to the UN and said at the UN, make the same digital norm shaping structure as there is in the OECD. I know it because I wrote it. I deliberately cut pasted the exact OECD structure of government council with advisory councils. I knew they will criticize and then I will tell them, OECD does it, why can't just expand 35 countries to 182 countries, nothing changes. And suddenly it becomes multi-stakeholder and all civil society, everybody wants to decry it. So I think we need, and that's okay. In 2010, we had very libertarian ideas about the internet, 2020, 21 people know we need to govern it. So I think, Unless we get our seats on the table at the global governance level, we would still be talking of these downstream effects because they are the natural necessary causes of that. So let's get 
tell that OECD cannot make global digital policy. All countries will have an equal role in making it. The day civil society starts saying it, we think we would have set the ball rolling. And as I said, we are not only working on these procedural issues, we have gone down and made a complete framework of community data structures. So we have to work on all that level and blindsiding ourselves to certain parts of it is not going to help. And right now, the structures of governance matter as much as the outputs and the substantive elements of uh, justice framework. Sorry, I took a little longer, but it was necessary. Not at all. I'm, I'm very interesting. And, and in full disclosure, I should <laughs> indicate that um, I'm sitting on the Global Partnerships Artificial, uh, Partnership for Artificial Intelligence um, Data Governance Working Group and um, managed actually <laughs> to get this data justice um, uh, work stream um, into an otherwise very technical um, not even that economic um, uh, kind of uh, approach to, um, to to data governance, uh, very kind of ethics by design and quite quite technical. Um, and I suppose the question there of Parminda is, uh, you know, whether I suppose whether you can work from within the belly of the beast or actually whether you're co-opted simply by participation. The, the the working groups certainly are participatory, but you're right in that the um, the member states. Um, that to which the GPA you know, provides their research support and that sort of thing are, are of course the, the OECD members. Um, and so that's why um, I, I suppose you know, a number of us have raised the question of you know, to what degree is it a global partnership? Although there are some people from the global south, they're, they're, they're not necessarily a lot um, and um, not necessarily you know, because this is a research support group, mainly academia. So, um, uh, Lynette, perhaps that just really, um, you know, it takes us back to how, you know, we can um, get kind of broader participation and, um, uh, you know, um, agreement on some of these kind of normative things that, that you know, in which there's clearly um, not normative consensus. So, you know, we um, even you know what, what Jamila was speaking about. You know, um, it's 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 fine for us, you know, sitting around this table to be have have normative consensus. But in fact, you know, with China, the largest producer of of, of AI, um, well, challenging America certainly um, in terms of that. Um, you know, there's no normative consensus there um, around um, you know as there has been with around digital advancement um, previously, which has been dominated by. By, by the US um, and not even consensus on some of these issues between the European Union with a far more, um, you know, that's pushed back against some of the kind of self-regulatory um, frameworks that have gone on in the US. So what is possible with that? And just why, before you come back to us, I just want to urge people to um, please pop their questions in the chat or to, to put up their hands, please. So I really appreciate Praminda's view on what is happening. I want to give a complimentary view on what is not happening. When I think about history, I think about the non-aligned movement and how that formed in relation to a really uh, to a basic threat to the existence of a bunch of countries who were affected by the Cold War, right? And I'm wondering how far we have to go with rich state governance on AI, basically, before that kind of threat emerges for all the other states in the world, and we see some sort of non-aligned coalition emerging around AI governance. We've seen a putative uh, non-aligned coalition around data um, led out of, I think, Latin America at the moment uh, by Ulises Mejias, but I, I think that there is room for a more uh, pluralistic coalition around both economic and social interest with regard to AI that really forms itself around the non-aligned countries. And I think that's really worth exploring because as Parminda says, there are paradynamics in play here that are extreme and will be long lasting and that speak to the core economic interests of a group of the most powerful actors in the world. And the only really meaningful response we've seen to that before is either revolution from within those, those countries that has been disruptive of, of their ability to put forward their interests internationally or an online movement that is effective. Siswe, what do you, um, you know, what, what, what is your response to that? I mean, you know, Africa has historically um, 
not participated in some of these global governance forums. Of course, um, South Africa, um, together with the BRICS countries, together with um, Brazil and, and, and India particularly, have often resisted some of these um, uh, uh, efforts to, to um, force uh, you know, global uh, positions on various things, whether it's trade, whether it's on the WTO, on, on digital things, on, on digital taxation, various things, um, it's resisted. Um, often that resistance has been seen as um, counterproductive to various efforts to, um, you know, to, to get um, improved trade, to get innovation, to get these kinds of things. And the arguments have not come only from um, foreign companies trying to enter in, you know, in terms of data localization and flows and that sort of thing. It's also come from local companies that are saying, you know, it's no use just sitting on this data, we've got to be able to realize its value and we've got to be able to do things. So, um, you know, what we don't have consensus on the African continent. Um, how do we um, respond to those things? Or is, is it just going to be the traditional um, countries on the continent that speak about, you know, and, and on the various sub um, continents that speak about these issues? Um, I think, you know, a lot of resistance, as you've mentioned, you know, to, to, to conform to certain international standards or conventions, I think has primarily been political reasons, you know. For political reasons, certain countries align themselves with certain countries, and in terms of their foreign policy, they would want to be seen to align themselves with certain countries as well. But the, the reality of it in 2021, Oh, it's, it's quite fairly simple. Um, you know, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, it's either you, you comply or you don't compete. And, and, and compliance, I mean, I'm talking about internationally accepted norms, internationally accepted standards. So this resistance that you've been talking about, I think it's something that is slowly coming loose. I mean, we've, we've seen in, in Africa, for instance, the right to, to privacy. It's not in our African um, uh, Charter of Human Rights. But interestingly, uh, last year, um, you know, there was a, a additional protocol on access to information um, uh, during COVID. And in that, they started speaking about um, data protection and the realization of protection of, of data or personal information. Um, and we've also now seen recently there is a, a development towards a African legal framework um, dealing with artificial intelligence. So I think it's more the political issues that make it seem like there is no uh, convention or, or, or Africa is, is resistive of being internationally aligned. But at the end of the day, if you want to compete internationally and survive internationally, you need to do what's happening in the international board right now. You need to have your data protection laws in place. You need to have your cyber security laws in place. You need to, where, where necessary, start regulating AI. I mean, for instance, in South Africa, we don't have a law specifically regulating AI, but we've recently, had a, a, a most fascinating decision of our patents office um, recognizing the registration of AI uh, as a result of AI of a patent. So, you know, the, the development is there. It may be very slow and it may not be seen from the outside as happening, but it is action. Yeah. So the, the, the AI patent is very interesting because I think um, after the initial kind of, oh, great excitement that this has happened in, in South Africa, it's actually not, not as positive and progressive as it, as it seems um, and probably legally problematic as well. But, um, you know, I, I just I suppose I wanted to, to, to take it back because I suppose that, you know, a lot of the, the economic logics might be there. Um, although, as Paraminda says, they certainly are framed to have different interests and outcomes, um, um, you know, in, in, their, um, uh, in their expression. Um, but obviously, at the, at the nub of it is actually um, this politics. And so, um, for example, you know, I, I, when I was speaking about the kind of resistance on certain issues that is possibly um, 
permeated opportunities for Africa to do other things. You know, it's been suggested that, you know, South Africa's position on the moratorium um, with the uh, WTO has impacted on its um, uh, possible kind of pushback or resistance to some of the data policy framework, um, which, you know, that which has, is absolutely critical for um, the continental free trade agreement if all countries, not only South Africa, Nigeria, and big, big ones are going to benefit from it, are able to, to conduct it. So th that um, stance on, on digital trade has kind of, you know, um, permeated into the African Union, which obviously, you know, requires a solidarity and the um, interoperability and these kinds of things. Um, so, I'm, you know, as I said, I think these are the kind of politics that we're dealing with. And I think we've also seen it very much in Latin America around, you know, the efforts to get a single digital market and the implications of that in, in this kind of political, um, you know, political economic um, bind that we sort of see. So Jamila, I wonder if you just wanted to share um, your view on some of these political issues, which I think you alluded to right at the start. Definitely. Well, we have seen a, a very significant shift in what um, in the type of leadership that we had in Latin America in terms of uh, internet governance and that affects how we are approaching to other types of uh, technology nowadays, for instance, um, to, to dialogue a bit with what uh, Perminder was mentioning before. Right now, several of our countries, uh, Latin American countries, also adopt the OECD principles, have also uh, tried to develop their own AI strategies following the same uh, types of um, language on uh, ethics, use of AI, and etc. And right now, um, we could have the opportunity in Brazil to develop one uh, more specific type of regulation on AI. But in this very moment, this, this regulation on AI that could try to foster and could try to implement some of the principles and some of the, the, the ideas that we are sharing and that we are um, thinking about right now um, is mostly captured by private interests also and risks putting uh, or fragilizing the data protection uh, framework that we um, approved some years ago, a few years ago uh, here in Brazil. So um, it's very concerning to see that Brazil that has had the leadership at some point when it came to um, digital rights, internet rights, etc., cetera, um, is now and could have the opportunity also to advance in thinking about AI from uh, a Latin American perspective, a global South perspective, uh, bringing contextual uh, issues and problems um, into question and bringing some limits to the advance of some types of technology is also um, uh, running into adopting regulation that would basically facilitate implementation with little safeguards and little protection and fragilize um, um, people's uh, uh, rights. And at the same time, another point that I wanted to, to add to that, uh, using the opportunity to question these uh, global infrastructures that are being um, deployed. Because one thing that I guess it's, it's also um, something that you were touching, Alison, right now has to do with how um, countries like Latin American countries that are mostly consumers of foreign technologies offer knowledge and intelligence to foreign countries and companies that then uh, will continue to um, um, uh, increase global inequalities. And I can talk about, for instance, how tech, global tech companies have uh, gone into the educational system. And by that, it, by the deregulation and facilitation of access even to scientific uh, knowledge and etc., with no considerations or safeguards. So yes, I would um, also put that into the table in our conversation about how do we shift the spaces for global regulation of our global standard uh, standards on these technologies, and uh, think about how we build public good infrastructure, common infrastructure that could be shared among um, countries also as something that we have to continue to develop in order to think about uh, justice and the, the um, um, shrinking of inequalities and not the opposite. Absolutely. Um, I'm just 
I'm very keen to see some hands, which I don't see. I don't know if I've missed anybody. Please just put on your uh, mic and speak if you if you have some questions. I um, don't see anything in the chat, Nashi, uh, Nashi Longo. I don't know, off on the floor, it doesn't look like there are any questions there. Keto, it looks like the chat's empty. And I can see all these interesting people who are sitting in the audience. And I'm wondering if Yik Chan Chin will allow me to ask her if she can um, share some of her insights. Um, Yik Chan Chin has done some a very detailed and in-depth work on, on China and internet governance. And I mean, particularly in the African context, um, and, and my very limited understanding of, 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 of Chinese policy in this area, but in some of the engagements I've had um, over the years with um, Peking University, the focus at their African Study Center has really been on, um, you know, they, they're actually focusing on those second and third generation rights and believe that once those are taken care of, these first generation rights will, will, <laughs> may follow. Um, uh, and of course, I've been providing enormous um, physical resources for digitization and datification on the African continent, to which there have been these very um, polarized responses. So some people have seen this very, has well, have welcomed this against, you know, American and European domination of, you know, companies from the continent. And this is actually a new one. Others are very concerned about um, China's, um, you know, uh, human rights records and these kinds of things. Yik Chan, do you mind us um, yeah. calling on you? No, no problem, Anison. It's my pleasure to uh, share my some experience about uh, China's uh, approach. I think, um, as I, as far as I uh, understand from my research, is that. Uh, uh, in terms of the data, you know, transporter data flow and AI, because this is all related to ge geopolitics, as we all know that, you know. So basically, we, we can see the global tendency is that uh, it's really hard to reach any international convention or international law at the moment uh, in regarding how to govern the data or in, even God govern the AI. Uh, UNESCO just uh, proposed some, you know, framework, but it's very difficult to reach a binding law, you know, international law. So what we're, we're seeing is a tendency, there's a kind of alliance between different uh, groups, for example, like uh, G7 countries, and uh, also like uh, uh, in America, they have US and Mexico, you know, or Japanese, this kind of the uh, regional multilateral agreements. I think China is also doing the, as some colleague just mentioned, is doing the same thing, you know, because they also proposed like a global government data initiative last year in 2020 uh, 20 by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So that is a kind of their proposal to how to govern the, the, the global flow of data. Um, but I think at the moment, there's very few country, you know, has responded to that. Uh, so, so we can see Basically, so the future will be uh, there's an arc of the international convention, but then there's regional multilateral agreements in governing the probably at the moment is uh, about the data, but in the future probably is uh, about uh, artificial intelligence or cloud, you know, standard. But I think uh, what uh, the next step is for the UN, the United Nations. The United Nations recently they published a report say they want to you know modify their their strategy to make the multilateral approach to be more inclusive. So they hope they can uh, play a kind of central institutional role, at least to build up some norms, which is soft norms, or you know, or, or standard or framework. Uh, so kind of the to govern the, the global flow. Another thing is about uh, the data. I think is also aligned to the WTO talk. So and I think China's a uh, worry the main worry for china is that they know you know all these things is play with the geopolitics and the political struggling between the old you know like a powerful country and china and the developing countries such as asia or africa so they're people they're quite worried they, they, they will be in, excluded from all this agreement because of the recent the z7 digital trade agreement and um, basically China was not uh, allowed to join because they're not a G7 countries. And also the other agreement between the UK, European Union and also Japan, you know, 
or, or many agreement China could not join, even they, they have, but, but they continue to apply be part of the membership. I think they're trying to not be isolated from those groups, you know, uh, but we will see whether uh, they will be allowed to join. I think uh, uh, if they're not allowed and they probably will build up and the, 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 the division will be very uh, obviously. So will be some, you know, one of the group like uh, they think this is more democratic country, you know, which Russia and China was cl classified as an undemocratic country. So they were not allowed to join. But I think the, the, the issue is much more complicated than whether you are democratic or non-democratic. There's many issues related to, you know, developing, developing countries need and developing countries needs and also infrastructure issues as well. So I do not think we should, uh, you know, talk about all these issues, just be, just use the term of democracy or non-democracy you know, to divide the, the, the camps. I think, yeah, I, I think this is this is absolutely the question and it kind of takes us full circle to the point that um, Lynette was making around um, the lessons of history from the non-aligned movement, because I think, um, you know, great parts of the global south, certainly Africa, um, have, are kind of, you know, really just in the fallout of these um, efforts to try and get kind of normative consensus, essentially around the big powers. Um, but, yeah. you know, this, uh, there's some, you know, um, break put on by India or South Africa or something on some of these things, um, they, they just forge ahead. And then I think the work of the various people on this panel is indicating that, um, you know, the, the, the kind of multilateral agreements that, um, you know, that are very high level normative agreements that we get, or even on standards and those kinds of things, don't necessarily deal with the issues of redress, of justice, of, um, you know, actual e equality and equity, not just inclusion, you know, not just crumbs from the table, but actually um, sitting at the table. So I think there's, there's obviously a, you know, an enormous amount for us to, to um, explore here from a research point of view and from another point and, and from a you know, policy point of view. I think at this moment, um, Quito, we're likely to just disappear into the ether as the IGF um, removes us um, from, this, from this room. But I just wanted to thank you all very, very much. If anybody has one last burning thing that they just feel they have to say, um, please use the few seconds, but realize that you may just be cut off midstream. I saw several people wanting to say things, but perhaps there's just not enough time to do so. Yeah. I think the last point I want to say is that I, I, I did think the solidarity, the, the concept proposed by UN is very useful. You know, when we say solidarity, it's not about equality, it's about uh, some big countries should show more responsibility to help the, you know, uh, developing country or weak country, you know. So I think the solidarity is the key concept for us to help each other. I, it's think, I think you're right, um, Yik Chen. I just think there's been some um, skepticism of what some of these declarations of solidarity mean. Um, and I think, you know, it would be great if those can be overcome. Um, um, uh, Perminda actually points to the UNCTAD digital economy report this year, which is really goes, you know, beyond other reports to try and speak about, um, you know, development and, and ensuring that these data developments are actually um, you know, more equitable, that the benefits are more equitably spread. But again, the real challenge, um, I think you would agree, Parminda comes in, how, how do we deal with that? You know, if we're actually dealing with profound structural inequalities, how do we actually do that? And how do we do it in the short term? I see Parminda has his hand up. So perhaps you can close off for us, Parminda. Yeah, so ready to disappear in the ether, but meanwhile, uh, so what the point Yik Chen, Chen made about solidarity, this has been also been made by the, Lancet Commission on Digitalization of Health. But see, all these things operate at different layers. Philanthropy, solidarity, goodness, ethics is one sphere. Rights, being on the table. These are hard things which are of a different kind. I just want to be the table if I even have make the most uh, screwed up law. So solidarity, philanthropism, phil philanthropy, big nations helping small is one sphere. They're all good. After all, we as an NGO, thrive on aid, which almost all come from the Western countries. They allow us to, in that way, speak. But I think the hardcore issues about who makes those norms uh, and who makes those soft laws 
and who sits on the table is very important and a slightly different layer and both layers uh, I think are fine. Thank you so much. IGF is urging us to, to, to say goodbye. So thank you all so much for your time and uh, take care wherever you are. <laughs>